Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to MOOC NPTEL course on Bioengineering, an interface with Biology and Medicine. Last week we studied few basic concepts for cell cycle and development. We also saw many interesting examples. This week we are going to uh, discuss about amino acids, proteins and protein related technology especially how they have driven the field of proteomics. So, let us start with uh, some very basic uh, fundamental concepts for amino acids and proteins and then we will slowly build uh, these concepts further and then see how they can be utilized for various uh, new tools and technologies to study proteins in a very high throughput manner. So, first of all why studying proteins are crucial? Proteins perform a range of cellular functions and as a result they are the one which most accurately reflect what is going on inside the human body or physiology. Disease results as a part of protein malfunction. So, most of the drugs currently either are uh, depending on the protein function or their protein themselves. So, therefore, studying proteins becomes very crucial. Again to remind you from the central dogma which we talked in the beginning uh, which reflect that you know starting from DNA to RNA the process of transcription governs that and then from RNA to protein it is the translation process and then again protein gets further modified in the post translation modification and, and that kind of you know gives lot of functionality to the proteins. So, what are amino acids? Amino acids are building block of proteins, the basic monomeric unit of polypeptides and proteins. There are 20 standard amino acids which are having unique structures and properties that can be combined in multiple ways to make up the wide range of proteins known to us. Each amino acid is specified by three letter and single letter code. The amino acids they are uh, linked to each other with peptide bonds and they form eventually the polypeptide proteins. Here we have shown a basic amino acid structure with amino group, carboxyl group and R side chain which uh, keeps changing in different amino acids. Let us briefly start with the broad category of amino acids starting with aliphatic amino acids. These are large and diverse hydrocarbon side chains which enables them to form the compact structures. Some examples of these aliphatic amino acids include valine, leucine, isoleucine, methionine and proline. These are large aliphatic side chains and hydrophobic. The water soluble proteins are stabilized by the hydrophobic effects and then therefore, they have a tendency to uh, form the clusters because of the hydrophobic groups. Here I have shown you uh, the structures of these amino acids which are non-polar side chains, hydrophobic amino acids starting from the glycine the simplest one which is achiral uh, amino acid and you can see only hydrogen is in the side chain R group. And then alanine is uh, having methyl group CH3, then we have valine when we have CH3, CH3 and CH group. Then we have further methyl groups being added in leucine and the isoform of that which is isoleucine. Then we have methionine which is a sulfur containing amino acid includes thioether uh, group. Then we have phenylalanine with the uh, phenyl group, tryptophan rings which is uh, characteristic of tryptophan amino acid. And then we have proline which is uh, not having any free amino group and they have a ring structure which provides some sort of conformational restriction and that gives some sort of uniqueness to amino acid proline. Now, let us look at the polar side chain based amino acids which are hydrophilic in nature. For example, serine, uh, serine is having a CH 2 OH group, it resembles like alanine, but having unique uh, hydroxyl group OH group. Then we have threonine which resembles with valine, but it also has the hydroxyl group. 
So, it has additional asymmetric center. Then we have a cysteine amino acid which is having sulfhydryl or thiol groups, then tyrosine amino acid, asparagine and glutamine which has these CH2, CNH2 O bond. Then coming to electrically charged side chain or hydrophilic amino acids, uh, we have aspartic acid and glutamic acid which are acidic and having negatively charged uh, groups. Then we have uh, lysine, arginine and histidine which are having the positive charge and these are basic amino acids. Uh, they are again characterized with uh, in the case of lysine with amino group, in case of arginine with the gonadinium group and in case of histidine having one imidazole group. So, I am going to talk about uh, some of these amino acid structures in some more detail in the animation, but for the time being let us you know focus on aromatic amino acids uh, looking at these three phenylalanine, tyrosine and tryptophan. Uh, the phenylalanine has a phenyl ring as you can see in the structure, a uh, tyrosine uh, having a reactive hydroxyl group and then tryptophan is having a indole ring uh, which are you know two fused rings are there with NH. So, now uh, these kind of properties of these aromatic amino acids they give them the hydrophobic characteristics like especially in case of uh, the phenylalanine whereas, the uh, tyrosine and tryptophan they are more hydrophilic because of the presence of OH and NH group. These uh, aromatic amino acids are also being utilized for uh, you know measuring the uh, concentrations uh, in the protein and people look into the absorption spectra of tyrosine and tryptophan. So, as shown here on the slide that tryptophan and tyrosine aromatic rings they strongly absorb at the UV light and the light absorption is a characteristic which can be used for the protein estimation. So, as you mentioned that you know these uh, amino acids uh, they come together to, uh, to form peptide bonds and the peptide bond is formed during the process of linking together these uh, amino acids with the carboxyl group of one amino acid uh, being linked to the amino group of another amino acid with the loss of a water molecule. Let us now review some of these concepts in an animation. Amino acids are the building blocks or monomers that make up proteins. They consist of a central alpha carbon atom bonded covalently to an amino group, a carboxyl group, a hydrogen atom and a variable side chain also called the R group. Amino acids are the basic monomeric constituents of proteins found in varying amounts depending upon the type of protein. They are classified based on the properties of their side chains or R groups which vary in size, structure and charge. The polarity of the side chains is one of the main bases for classification. Amino acids having non-polar aliphatic side chains include glycine, alanine, proline, valine, leucine, isoleucine and methionine. Essential amino acids are those that cannot be synthesized de novo in the organism and therefore must be included in the diet. Non-essential amino acids on the other hand can be synthesized from various precursors. Serine, threonine, aspergine, glutamine and cysteine consist of polar but uncharged side chains. Lysine, arginine and histidine have positively charged side chains. Aspartic acid and glutamic acid are polar and negatively charged amino acids. Tryptophan, tyrosine and phenylalanine are all essential amino acids having an aromatic side chain. Amino acids are the building blocks or monomers that make up proteins. Amino acids are oriented in a head to tail fashion and linked together such that the carboxyl group 
of one amino acid combines with the amino group of another. Two amino acids joined together by means of such a condensation reaction with the loss of a water molecule forms a dipeptide. Many such amino acids linked together form a polypeptide. The peptide bond is rigid due to its partial double bond character arising from resonance structures. However, the bonds between the alpha carbon and amino and carboxyl groups are pure single bonds that are free to rotate. What are the amino acid properties in relation to isomerism? So, let us talk about optical isomerism. Uh, just imagine the chiral molecules they interact with the plane polarized light in such a manner that they can rotate the plane of polarization either in the clockwise or the counterclockwise directions. So, depending on that in which direction the molecule rotates the plane of the polarization can be designated as plus you can say dextro rotatory or you can say levo rotatory. This nomenclature is not exactly same as the D and L designations which actually refers to the absolute configurations is specified on the basis of their relationship with D and L glyceraldehyde. Majority of the amino acids which are found in the proteins are of the L configurations. Let us review these concepts in the following animation. Before learning about the isomerism, let us first know what chirality is. The term chirality arises from the Greek term care, meaning handedness. Just like the two hands are non superimposable mirror images of each other, amino acid molecules are also non superimposable due to their chiral alpha carbon center. All amino acids except glycine contain an estimetric center that makes them chiral in nature due to which they can rotate the plane of polarized light. The two enantiomers designated as D and L rotate the plane of polarization in opposite directions. The two enantiomers of amino acids are non-superimposable mirror image due to the spatial arrangement of four different groups about the chiral carbon atom. Rotation of either isoma about its central axis will never give rise to the other isomeric structure. What are the acid and base properties of amino acids? All amino acids they exist in the completely protonated forms in the acidic medium which is known as the cationic form. Both amino and the carboxyl groups are protonated and the state in which the amino acids has no net charge that is known as the deuteroin. It is neutral because of the presence of NH3 plus and C double O minus groups. What is the anionic form of amino acid? In a highly alkaline medium, all amino acids exist in their anionic form because of the presence of C double O minus groups. So, looking at these properties of cationic and anionic forms and deuteroins which are formed, one could do titration curve. So, the number of equivalents of alkali being consumed during the process of addition of alkali to the amino acid solution is plotted against pH of the solution in the flask which yields the unique titration curve of each amino acid. The titration curve depicted corresponds to that of glycine. Let us review this concept in animation. Amino acids in acidic medium exist in the completely protonated form carrying a net positive charge. This can be confirmed by means of simple paper electrophoresis. The sample solution is applied at the center of the strip and current is passed through it. The color 
colorless amino acid solution can be detected by spraying the strip with ninhydrin which gives it a purple color. Migration of the spot towards the negatively charged cathode confirms the net positive charge of the amino acid. All amino acids exhibit a characteristic titration curve with distinct pK values. 0.1 N NaOH is added to the acidic amino acid solution. The cationic form of the amino acid is gradually converted into its neutral or zwitter ionic form by loss of a proton from its COOH group. This can again be confirmed by electrophoresis where there is no migration of the sample spot. Number of equivalents of alkali being consumed is plotted against the pH of the amino acid solution to obtain the titration curve. pK1 of glycine is found to be 2.34, that is, it starts to lose its carboxyl group proton at this pH. Removal of the proton from the amino group constitutes the second stage of the titration curve. Continued addition of alkali to the amino acid solution gradually converts the zwitter ionic form into the anionic form. Migration of the sample spot towards the anode during electrophoresis confirms this. The pK2 of an amino acid is obtained by continued addition of alkali to the neutral solution of the amino acid. pK2 of glycine is found to be 9.6. Some amino acids having positively or negatively charged side chains will have pK1, pK2 and pKr which corresponds to ionization of the side chain. These amino acids have good buffering capacity around 1 pH unit on either side of their pK values. After discussing about uh, amino acids, now let us move on to the proteins. So what are proteins? These are linear polymers which are built of uh, monomers of amino acids and they have wide range of functional group which accounts for various protein function uh, and then that reactive properties are very crucial for the enzyme and the protein function. Uh, there are many properties like protein protein interaction, protein biomolecular interaction which generates a synergistic capability which may not be obtained just by studying an individual protein and therefore it becomes very crucial to study proteins together uh, and then you know one need to understand that how in totality proteins are governing that function. So understanding protein function is key to biology. Let us look at some of these uh, key characteristics here like enzyme catalysis where enzymes catalyzes all the biochemical reactions by increasing rate of reactions. So enzymatic catalysis uh, is the process when enzymes catalyze all biochemical reactions by increasing the rate of reactions. There are proteins which are involved in the transport and storage uh, processes. Uh, the proteins which can transport the small molecules like oxygen, iron, etc. Proteins are also involved in doing the coordinated motion, for example, muscle contraction, bacterial chemotaxis, chromosomal movements, uh, sperm propulsion, etc. All of these are coordinated motion which are governed by different proteins. Uh, various mechanical strength is also governed by the uh, different proteins. For example, skin and bones uh, by the uh, collagen proteins and hair with the keratin protein. Uh, discussing about protein function, proteins are also involved in the immunity process. For example, antibodies which exemplify the specificity of protein protein and protein ligand interactions. They are also involved in neurotransmission which is in the response of cells to the stimuli in the nerve cells. 
In the process of growth and differentiation, for example, the transcription factors that are involved in the gene expression processes during growth and development. So, I am sure you appreciate that you know proteins play key structural and functional role and they define you know wide range of functions uh, involved in signaling, transport, catalysis, moment, structure, regulation etcetera. Let us now discuss about uh, different levels of protein structures. So, the primary structure refers to the uh, sequence of amino acids, the secondary structure refers to the locally folded regions, the tertiary structure refers to the overall folding of the uh, protein structures and quaternary structure refers to all the interaction between individual protein subunits in a multi subunit complex. Let us start with uh, each of these uh, structural detail of uh, proteins, let us start with primary structure. The sequence of amino acids are joined together by the peptide bond which forms a linear polymer constituting the primary structure of the protein. The linear polypeptide chains are often cross linked most commonly by the cysteine bonds and then they are linked together to form a cysteine unit. The first primary structure that was deduced uh, that was for a protein insulin which was uh, discovered by scientist Frederick Sanger. So, what is the significance of these uh, you know, primary structure or the amino acid sequences? It is essential for the elucidation of its mechanism of action. It also determines the three dimensional structure of the proteins. The amino acid alteration can produce certain abnormalities in the individuals and diseases like you know sickle cell anemia is one of the example in which how the amino acid uh, alteration could uh, you know just for single amino acid change. Uh, could lead to you know certain abnormality. The sequences also tells us an evolutionary history of the protein and lot of evolutionary relationship of organisms could be established looking at their amino acid sequences. Let us now talk about secondary structures. The folding of a polypeptide backbone by means of internal hydrogen bonds between uh, nearby amino acid residues that gives rise to a regular arrangement which is defined as the secondary structure of proteins. The different type of alpha helices and beta sheets which are most commonly observed in the secondary structure of proteins due to their highly favorable phi and psi angles which is described by the Ramachandran plots. The amino acid proline it tends to disrupt the helix and it is often found uh, you know bending in the structure which is known as the reverse turn or the beta bends. Let us look at the alpha helices first. So, proteins have variable helix contents, the alpha helix is a rod like structure, the main chain is tightly coiled around helical axis and the side chains they are extended outwards which is away from the helical axis. There are specific hydrogen bonds which can stabilize these helical cores to make alpha helix bonds. The alpha helix is formed in the regions which are stabilized by the hydrogen bonds between atoms of the polypeptide backbones. and uh, residue uh, the carboxyl group of uh, the, the first amino acid uh, with the uh, NH group of the fourth is forming uh, this bond. And similar thing of the alpha helix could be seen in uh, different examples whether it is a keratin protein or it is collagen protein when you can see even double helix or triple helix is being uh, present and they actually uh, you know provide lot of strength to uh, these protein the structures beta sheets. These are another common periodic structural motifs uh, which are fully extended structure, they are parallel or anti parallel and uh, we can see the structures of uh, starting from you know the parallel and the anti parallel uh, beta strands. So, the beta plated sheet is composed of two or more polypeptide chains shown uh, in this on the screen is the beta strand uh, on the top and the beta sheet. Uh, one of the example shown here is the spider's silk fiber which is one of the structural protein which contains beta plated sheets. Let us move on to tertiary structures now. Uh, the tertiary structures uh, uh, refer to the interactions especially hydrophobic, electrostatic, hydrogen bonds etcetera between amino acid side chains which are located far apart in the polypeptide sequence and that causes the protein to fold resulting into a three dimensional arrangement of atoms which is known as tertiary structure. The folding takes place in such a manner that the hydrophobic residues they get buried to form the core while the hydrophilic amino acids they remain on the surface in contact with the polar surroundings. 
So, there are numerous interactions which specialize uh, tertiary structure of the proteins and uh, that is shown here uh, in some of the examples especially for the myoglobin and trans uh, thyroidine proteins. Uh, these uh, structures could be studied using NMR and X-ray crystallography which provides the detailed three dimensional structures. So, what are quaternary structures? Many proteins have more than one polypeptide chains also called a subunit that are assembled together by various interactions like electrostatic, van der Waals, disulfide bonds and that gives rise to the quaternary structure. So, quaternary structure is referring to the interactions between individual protein subunits in a multi subunit complex and it actually provides the final level of protein structure. It also depicts the spatial arrangements of subunits and their interactions and how these polypeptide chains assemble to form these multi subunit structures. Shown here are the examples of hemoglobin and transthyretin. So, this is how we can summarize these uh, different level of protein structures. Uh, we have primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure and the quaternary structure. Let me explain you this in more detail in the uh, following animation. Amino acids are joined together in a head to tail arrangement by means of peptide bonds with the release of water molecules. This linear sequence of amino acids constitutes the primary structure. The folding of the primary structure into the secondary is governed by the permissible rotations about the phi and psi angles. Not all values of these angles lead to sterically favorable conformations. The Ramachandran's plot defines these regions of favorability. Amino acids along the polypeptide backbone interact through hydrogen bonds, leading to secondary structures. The alpha helix has intra-chain hydrogen bonds between the H of NH and O of CO in every fourth residue. Most alpha helices are right-handed since this conformation is energetically more favorable. The amino acid proline which has a cyclic side chain does not fit into the regular alpha helix structure and thereby limits flexibility of the backbone. It is commonly referred to as the helix breaker. Amino acids along the polypeptide backbone interact through hydrogen bonds, leading to secondary structures. The alpha helix has intra-chain hydrogen bonds between the H of NH and O of CO in every fourth residue. Most alpha helices are right-handed since this conformation is energetically more favorable. The amino acid proline which has a cyclic side chain does not fit into the regular alpha helix structure and thereby limits flexibility of the backbone. It is commonly referred to as the helix breaker. Alpha helices can also wind around each other to form stable structures such that their hydrophobic residues are buried inside while their polar side chains are exposed to the aqueous environment. Alpha keratin, the major protein component of hair, consists of two such coiled coils forming a left-handed superhelix. Collagen, which is a fibrous component of skin, muscle, etc., consists of three such coiled alpha helices. It has a characteristic recurring amino acid sequence of glycine proline hydroxyproline with glycine appearing at every third residue. Beta pleated sheets 
discovered by Pauling and Corey, is another common secondary structure with periodic repeating units. It is composed of two or more polypeptide chains with their side chains oriented above and below the plane. It is an extended structure with hydrogen bonds between the chains stabilizing it. Amino acids in parallel beta sheets which run in the same direction interact with two different amino acids on the adjacent strand through hydrogen bonds. Amino acids in anti-parallel strands on the other hand interact with only one amino acid on an adjacent strand. Almost all proteins exhibit a compact globular structure which is possible only if there are turns or loops between the various regions. Beta turns, which are the most commonly observed turn structures, consist of rigid, well-defined structures that usually lie on the surface of the protein molecule and interact with other molecules. A combination of secondary structures such as the helix turn helix, which consists of two alpha helices separated by a turn, is also observed, and these are known as supersecondary structures or motifs. Amino acids located far apart on the polypeptide chain interact with each other by means of hydrogen bonds, electrostatic interactions, disulfide bridges, etc., allowing the protein to fold three dimensionally in space giving rise to the tertiary structure. Folding takes place such that the hydrophobic residues are buried inside the structure while the polar residues remain in contact with the surroundings. The tertiary structure of myoglobin determined by John Kendrew clearly revealed that the nature of amino acid side chains dictate their location in the tertiary structure. Hydrophobic residues are found buried inside the structure while the polar amino acids are found on the surface. 70% of the main chain of myoglobin is folded into alpha helices with the rest being present in the form of turns and loops which are essential to give it a compact structure. Different subunits or polypeptide chains interact with one another and are held together by means of ionic, electrostatic, van der Waals, etc. interactions. Such multi-subunit proteins are said to have a quaternary structure, the final level of protein structure. So today in this lecture, uh, I try to refresh you about some of the basic concepts of amino acids and proteins. Of course, this whole subject uh, needs a lot more detailed uh, study, but you know, just to uh, give you some basics and some idea the uh, kind of diverse side chain groups present in amino acids and why they are so crucial and why the studying proteins are so difficult because of the you know so much uniqueness in these amino acids and 20 different forms they give rise to many different type of proteins and studying the proteins they therefore becomes on one hand very crucial but also becomes very challenging. In case of DNA studies we had only 4 base pairs to study ATGC, in case of amino acids we have 20 combinations to a study. We do not have the techniques uh, like polymerase chain reaction which we have studied earlier in case of DNA technologies which could just simply amplify the DNA molecule. We do not have techniques like that in the case of uh, the protein technologies where we, you can start with a you know, small amount of protein and amplify that to obtain the huge amount of protein. So, these are many challenges to study the proteins and proteins are usually very dynamic, they are very labile, sometimes they are you know, uh, very short life. So, studying proteins becomes very challenging and therefore, knowing their basics and properties are very crucial. 
I just try to give you some glimpse of the structure of the uh, different levels of protein structures, primary, secondary, tertiary and quaternary. And intention is that after reviewing some of these basic concepts, you should go back, read the textbooks in much more detail and then you are more prepared to actually learn the tools and techniques which are employed to study proteins, uh, especially for the various type of protein research and proteomics research. So, in the next couple of lectures, I am going to talk about different technologies, how they are trying to study the proteins and the wide, you know, the complex protein mixtures, especially at the proteome level and to do that different type of protein properties are being utilized. So, in the next couple of lectures, we have more you know, technology based uh, understanding and then these basic concepts will be very useful over there. Thank you.